Blast Theory. So Blast Theory is an interactive artist group based in Brighton. It's led by three artists who have been together for about 23 years now. Um, the work they create is always about audiences, often audiences as the protagonists of the piece. And we look at, we're interested in the kind of comfort spaces that new technology opens up and always try to encourage audiences to kind of question their place in society um, through subjects that they might not otherwise engage with. Um, so I'm going to tell you about Karen, which is the Kickstarter, which is the project that we kickstarted for last year. Um, um, so our funding goal for it was £15,000. We achieved just over this. Um, there are a lot of fees involved, which I'll share till the end of giving you a nice surprise. <laughs> um, and I'll show you the video now to give you an overview of what the project is. Hi, we're Blast Theory, and we make interactive projects where you are the lead. Over the years, we've invited you to be kidnapped, to rob a bank, to confess your secrets on a bike ride, and to play games with us online and on the streets. I'm going to hide, I think, or try and hide. Everywhere from the Venice Biennale to the Sundance Film Festival. Now we want to get personal with you. We want you to meet Karen. Karen is a life coach who wants to be your friend. Day or night, you can catch up with her for a bit of personal time. Karen interacts with you in a way that hasn't been done before. It's a mix of storytelling and games that is intimate and personal. I thought so. You're just like me. In the background, we're using a bunch of psychological tests. As you chat with Karen, she gets to know you and the story adapts accordingly. She's fun and funny, always pushing the boundaries as her friend crush on you intensifies. Um, we're interested in how governments and large companies such as Facebook are collecting data on us without our consent. As artists, we want to find a way that's playful and open and fun to use that data. If you imagine that your friends will play as well, that you know your relationship with her might be slightly different than it is with other people. So I think that's quite nice that you might go, you know, what did Karen say to you today, or what did you say back to her, and 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 she's know. got that desperation that we all have to connect with someone, to be really good friends with someone, to be honest and to be open. She wants to have the conversations that we normally shy away from having, and I think that's her charm, why you warm to her, but that's also why she's a little bit dangerous. We've done the research and we've built a prototype, but a lot of our ideas are still on paper. We need your help to fund the development time that we need to bring Karen to life. Karen, so hopefully that gives you an overview of who we are, what we were fundraising for and how much we wanted. Um, so Karen is an app that mixes storytelling, psychological profiling, and gaming to kind of present a more personalised story to you in a way that hasn't been done before and is a reflection on kind of big data. Um, so why crowdfunding? So there are several reasons. Firstly was Catalyst. So we received Arts Council funding um, as part of the Catalyst programme with Fabrica in Brighton to look at ways of diversifying our income streams. And crowdfunding was something that we kind of established early on that we wanted to try. And this allowed us to have the capacity to actually do that. So it meant that we were able to, able to engage a fundraising consultant initially to kind of help us with this and other things. And also to hire Anne, who is here somewhere and is incredible over there. <laughs> we managed our campaign throughout, which meant we had someone full time on it, which meant that nobody else was kind of taken away from it to that extent. Um, we also had an unsuccessful funding bid. So we um, are funded quite heavily on projects. We put um, a lot of effort into one funding bid that we really relied on and we didn't get it. Um, so that meant that we had a hole, which was really exciting, um, and it also meant that we actually had the time and the energy to kind of go ahead and do it. Um, <coughs> and it also meant that this project that we were working on, it felt like the right one to go for. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, partly um, because of the partners we were involved in, we'd worked on it for sort of two years on and off, um, research and development um, with National Theatre Wales and two researchers. Um, it also had international reach, so a lot of our projects are quite location specific and not everybody can get involved at the same time. And this is one where people could, and it was a good chance to kind of test our audience. And that's kind of the third reason was the audience development. We wanted to see who our audiences were and are, how we can engage in them, and what would this mean for creative development of our work as well. Um, so, what's involved? So, 
they are a lot of work and there's no way of lying about that. Um, I'm not going to go through everything in detail today because uh, there's too much to go through, but do grab me and Anne if you want to know anything. Um, but research, so we looked at kind of similar campaigns, successful and unsuccessful, um, and reviewed different crowdfunding platforms. We did a lot, a lot of planning, like trying to plan as much content as we could in advance, looking at our contacts, coming up with a strategy for that. Um, we've got our projects, this is right in the project page, making the video, but also how it links back to our own website as well. So we had like a pop-up thing on our page that linked people to the Kickstarter so they could go straight there and put um, some money in if they'd like to. Um, rewards, um, I'll come on to this in a bit. This is one of the things that we found one of the hardest things to do, and that's looking at what the rewards are that are relevant to the project that people might want in return for their investment. Communication, so this uh, is the big part of work. It's fun and it's big and it's actually really important. So planning who we're communicating with, how often we're communicating with them, um, and engaging in conversations with them. And then post campaigns, that's looking at kind of sending out the, um, the rewards, any communications, and ongoing audience development after the project launch. So by Kickstarter. So um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are definitely the ones that are kind of the two top choices for us. There are other ones out there as well that we have been put in contact with as sponsoring, just with the charity organisations and Zekus, which has a strong focus on startups. But as it came down to Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and we kind of flipped between both of them quite a lot. Um, largely because Indiegogo is flexible funding, so if you don't reach your target, you can still keep some of your money. With Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. If you don't reach your target, you don't get the money. So obviously, having not got funding, I was kind of leaning towards Indiegogo for a while so we could try and get some money. Um, but with Kickstarter, we just thought we wanted to risk it and wanted to try it all or nothing. We thought it would give us the drive and we thought it would give our audiences the drive as well to support us. Um, that was quite scary. So I've, just got, I've got a really big highlight thing saying vulnerable here because it did um, put us in quite a vulnerable state with that. Um, and it was really scary. And I think not only to not get the money, but to have think if we didn't succeed, to have people think that meant that our project wasn't worth investing in. And that's quite scary when you've been working on something for such a long time. Um, so for us, planning was kind of the key thing. Um, so I know Sarah um, actually touched upon this earlier. We kind of really tried to identify who our audiences might be early on. Um, so this is Blast Theory fans and NCW, which is National Theatre Wales. And we kind of looked at the partners involved and thought who might be interested in our project. So from this, we came up with digital art fans, early app adopters, um, academics, psychology students, tech bloggers, big data lovers, gaming community, experimental immersive theatre fans, art theatre bloggers, interactive storytelling fans. So it's obviously quite a big audience out there that's trying to get them. I think one of the things to bear in mind is that you know you love your project and it means a lot to you, but generally it's probably going to be 0.001% of people out there that actually care, but those people that do care will get behind you and fund it and spread it out to their networks. So if I do this exercise, and it's really worth doing, and you can look at how and who you can engage early on. Um, yeah. Just skipped. Um, friend raising. So, um, friend raising is something that we kind of, I actually just learned that I got this wrong. <laughs> This friend raising is something that um, Yancy co-founded Kickstarter said, which is that projects that reach 30% of their funding goals succeed more than 90% of the time. Now we kind of had it in our heads that that was 30% of the funding before you launch publicly, so that's what we were aiming for. So we were trying to get 30% of the funding before we had a wider public launch, which we thought would help us kind of succeed in the target. I think the, the quote means something slightly different, but I think you stick with that, it kind of works, so that goes well. Um, so to do this, we were trying to really establish how we could get that, so we were aiming for just under five grand. And part of what we did was really like analyze our contact database. Um, this is something that I don't think anyone in the company had done for a long time. And so it was a useful exercise in a lot of ways and it spent, took us hours to do and a lot, a lot of hours. So it was going through our contacts, looking who was on there and who could help. And we split them into groups. So we had contact group one, which was people closest to us who we thought were most likely to support the campaign, and that includes friends and family as well. People who could pick up the phone and say that we're doing this, something might be interested in, can you help? And we had contact group two. These were people that we were close with, that knew that they cared about the project, or that cared about the last theory, but you probably wouldn't feel as comfortable picking up the phone and asking them to support you. And then we had arts organisations, so organisations that we had relationships with, or even ones that we'd identified that might be interested in the project, 
and that we'd get on the phone to or get an email to and ask them to kind of spread the word about it. And then we have our wider circles, like our mailing list and some of our other networks. We have a group called Our Friends Elect, which is sort of like a free fan group, and beta testers, which are people that can sign up and test our projects. Um, I'm going to come, come on to the strategies of how we spoke to these people a bit later on. So again, this is kind of going back to the planning side of things, and I'm not going to go through it all, um, but these are some of the kind of key things that we looked at in advance. So page copy and images, videos. The video that I showed you before, as I explained to Andrew earlier, that we went through quite a lot of edits with that, um, mainly because we've been so focused on the project that actually when we looked at it at one point we thought it came across quite sexist, which is something that none of us wanted. The project's not about that, but because you know what the content is, you don't realise that the bits that you picked are made a different story to what the story is. So we re-entered that quite a lot. Um, social media plan, um, press release and press images. Um, I'm not touched on press throughout this and I can talk to people about it afterwards. But I think having a press pack ready to go is really helpful. Um, and we tried to make a decision as to whether or not we were going to try and push for press because kickstarting in crowdfunding campaigns aren't something new. I don't think people probably are as bothered about covering them. And we also wanted to balance if this project went ahead, should we be focusing on getting more press when it actually launches which is sort of the side that we took. I'm not sure if it was the right one on hindsight, I'm not sure what we've done differently, but I'm going to have to talk about that separately. Um, copy for mail outs, different contact groups, personalised emails for close friends and supporters, um, backer updates, which I'll come on to, um, quiet weeks and stretch goals. So stretch goals are, so we aim for 15,000, if you have received that, our next goal is 20,000, which would have meant that we could create an Android version of the phone. Okay, um, rewards. Um, so rewards are really important. It's something that um, backers are getting back for their investment into your project. This was definitely the hardest thing for us to do. Um, we've got an app, it's going to be free. That was something we want everybody to have. Other than that, what would people want? You know, at this stage, we didn't know if there was going to be any in-app purchases. We haven't created any merch particularly for it. I was looking at what people might want. Then we did create some merchandise. We looked at things kind of around Blast Theory that was interested. Things that kind of could develop the character of Karen a bit more that we could kind of create kind of as cheaply as we could, but still that something that was interesting to give to people. Um, don't rush it when you're trying to plan it. It really took us absolutely ages to do this and kind of getting advice on things for this as well. If you can keep rewards digital, um, just for costing and ease. Afterwards, it's a lot of people to keep up with and it, it does get quite expensive if you're selling t-shirts and you're shipping them out. Um, and one of the things as well is that the postage, you can put postage on the cost for the rewards, but that actually comes out of the grand total figure you have as well, which didn't kind of click until later on in the process. Content. So again, this comes to that thing where when you're so deeply engrossed in your project, and it probably is the greatest thing, but um, <coughs> it's make sure that it's clear to people what the project actually is and what you're trying to sell. Um, so we came to the site, you get a draft page of your um, Kickstarter page, and you can send that link to people. Um, and I think send to people that A, potentially don't know your work very well, or don't know what it is that you're trying to sell, it's really helpful for to buy them a drink afterwards. But you'll find that people come back with feedback, and people can be quite confused as to what it actually is, especially if it is an experimental or something a bit different. It can be hard to explain to people that might not have natural interest in that. Um, all the feedback is so useful and it actually kind of feeds into your creative process for the project as well. Again, if you've been so wrapped up in it, you know, don't you might not want necessarily feedback into that, but actually that kind of does help in knowing what your audiences are and how you can expand things in a way. Um, also on concepts, so yeah, we have this pop-up page on our website. If there's things you can do around it and any updates you can do kind of around branding. Um, I'm slightly going off track now. But um, if you start get a Kickstarter project page, um, project of the month or anything like that, if you can kind of update the content on your page to match that so people kind of know what's happening, it's really helpful to kind of keep on boosting that. Ooh. So communications, I realise you probably can't tell what this is. Um, this is a schedule of activity that we did for knowing who we were communicating to and when. So it's just got the dates at the top and the different contact groups down the side. Um, I think the key thing is that we were just trying to map out who we were talking to and how often and when 
Um, we didn't want people nagging people too much. We wanted to get a steady flow of what was going on and kind of bringing everybody into it. So that kind of thick line there is that first period where we were trying to get that 30% funding up front before we launched publicly. And the key thing is kind of at the end is thanking people and always thanking people throughout as well. And when the campaign's live, you hit a tumbleweed moment, a um, long, long, long moment, um, which everyone tells you is going to happen, and it's still absolutely terrifying when it does. So when you launch the campaign and you put a lot of work into it, you kind of you boosted up quite soon and got the kind of 30%. And then kind of steady, really steady for sort of the rest of the month until the end when everyone kind of jumps on it again. And I think it's part of this thing of people wanting to get behind something that they see successful and not kind of be the hero of peace in a way. Um, and it does happen and it is terrifying, especially if you have the app on your phone and you're used to looking for notifications, which dates people back in you and then it goes really quiet, it's horrible. Um, but I think the thing to do is to have something in that in-between time so you can keep people updated on what's going on and keep feeding content and not giving up the hope and not going quiet on it because people are still paying attention to what's happening. Um, so part of what we did was like backer updates. So these are things that kind of go as the page that um, you send an update goes to anyone that's back the project. You can then push these out on social media as well. You can set them as to whether they're private or public. So private ones will only go to the backers, public ones anyone can see them. And you can use this to your advantage um, if you post that on social media and it's something that looks intriguing. You could put it to private ones so that when they go to click on it, they can't actually access the content without backing the project. And this is a good way as well to kind of use your partners in the project. So this is Kelly Page, she was one of the researchers um, and she had, she was a really great public speaker. She's really into the psychological profiling. She was really behind the app and what it meant kind of artistically um, and kind of in the research field. So we kind of got her to do updates for us. She Skyped in from Chicago and we filmed it and um, put this out there as well. I think any kind of partners or any kind of contacts that you have with it that you can use for this is really good at kind of getting into their networks and tapping into them. Uh, it also is a good way of getting kind of questions from your audience, again kind of feeding into your, um, your kind of creative process with it. So we had questions that we kind of really anticipated, so people questioning about kind of mental health, just to play with the app, you know, mental health issues, how we deal with that, how we um, correspond to that. Um, if people were testing for personality disorders, you know, a lot of people were really wanted the Android version, which we couldn't do if we got 15,000. Um, knowing that and feeding that into the process, but also knowing that if we did only get 15,000, that the Android issue might become something bigger, or we were to get more funding, that we need to make sure we got Android to actually kind of meet people who want to do it. Um, and engaging with like, like it does build your audiences, and it does a lot of work for you, for your project afterwards, and building that kind of initial audience and communication strategy, knowing who you're going to talk to afterwards. Um, so post campaign. Um, so continuing to keep people updated on the project is essential. And also we kept the option open for people to donate if they had they missed the chance. We saw a few people that got in contact with us asking if they could still donate and their page wasn't live anymore. We set up a shop on our website where it was just sort of a ten pound one. It didn't have the same rewards as Kickstarter backers, so not to kind of annoy anybody, but offered a few percent of the perks. And afterwards we got uh, 17 of the backers and that was 210 pounds, which was something we weren't expecting, that had that not been there, that 210 pounds we wouldn't have got. Um, so using backers to promote the project as well, so I think it's kind of really building that communication with people and inviting them in. Um, I think that's what people want to be, it's what they want to be part of that journey. Uh, and we're continuing to use that and looking at how you can use that when the app is live, getting them behind it and getting them into it. We're also looking at converting people into long life, uh, lifelong supporters. Not quite sure how this will be. It's not just financially, it's for other projects. So um, we're not going to launch another Karen anytime soon, but for other work they might not have known about, kind of bringing them into that story and kind of getting them on board for future work. And we're also looking at kind of what other models we could do with this. So um, Coney, kind of the immersive kids group in London, have done two, three thousand pound um, Kickstarters in the space of about a year, I think, and they've both been successful, so that's something that we're interested in, potentially could do a sort of lower amount more often. We couldn't do something at Karen's scale each year, kind of the capacity, um, and for audience, we wouldn't have the same project, we would do it people all the time. Um, if we were to do something again, I'm quite interested in looking at 
if there is like a bespoke platform that we could make and invest in, it would save us on fees and help kind of push content out somehow. I don't know what that looks like yet, but there might be something out there for that. And then I'm just going back to the final cost. So £15,000 our target, we reached just over 17 and a half. We paid just under 1700 on fees to Kickstarter and card processing fees. The reward costs were about £850, before we put any packaging and posting on it. Staff time is a very modest estimate, it's about just under £1,800. Which based on that means we actually came up with a net profit of about £3,000. But, um, we built an audience. So we have got an audience for piece now, not only for the kind of project itself, but ongoing. We had a lot more subscribers to our mailing list afterwards. Um, we had 23% of people that funded the project directly through Kickstarter, so people that we hadn't pushed out to or that we didn't know before. Um, we have patrons now, so our top reward offer was patrons. We weren't sure if we were going to get them. Having looked at other campaigns, the top reward level never really went that much. Um, but we put three out there, we thought we'd try it, and they were all taken. And one of them was someone that we'd never heard of, we saw it through Twitter and got in touch, and that was for £1,500. So that was a great Kickstarter back into the seat. And the second one is the space, so we've now been co-commissioned by the space for this piece of work, which is amazing, it's taken us right out of the hole that we had before, and that we've put adequate staff time and development time into the piece, and we're doing it for Android now. And there's also two other very exciting things happening in New York related to the project that I can't announce yet, but that would be And that's it. Um, we have a crowdfunding on our website that Anne created, and it's like, amazing. If you're thinking about doing a campaign, it's really, really helpful, and it goes into more detail about different things. And that's on the website. Thanks very much.